You're listening to the Transforming Society podcast. I'm Richard Kemp, and on this episode, I'm joined by Anna Dornova, Professor of Sociology at the University of Vienna. Anna, along with her colleague Daniel Carell, guest edited the latest special issue of the Emotions and Society Journal, published by Bristol University Press. Titled Emotions and the Truths of Contentious Politics, Advances in Research on Emotions, Knowledge and Contemporary Contentious Politics, the special issue includes articles on the truth of facts versus the truth of feeling, and the weaponization of truth itself. Facts and expertise, once seen as separate from emotion, are now becoming understood as only one part of the development of knowledge. Events such as Brexit, Donald Trump's presidency, and now his possible second term, show us that it's essential we consider emotion as equally important as factual truths, something that this special issue investigates in a variety of areas, from culture and technology to nuclear science and within our own homes. Anna Donova, welcome to the Transforming Society podcast. Thank you for having me. It's yes. a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for coming on today. Yeah, it's great to, I'm really uh, looking forward to talking to you about these articles. It's such an interesting special issue. You say early on that um, a that a politicization or a, a weaponization of truth has constructed societal division between an emotional, ignorant public and a supposedly fact-oriented elite. Is this binary division harming society? Well, I think that maybe it should be said at the outset that binaries are oppositions through that we organize our world. And mm. it is something which has been with us since some time already. So it's not new. And it it does not to be necessarily harmful as such. But the way we use sometimes these opposition can be harmful if we, let's say that would be the short answer, push it more toward the radical. Like if we use these binaries as something ultimate without um, considering the diversity of the society we live in. Because the fact or the circumstances that we need to categorize our world is quite understandable. We need to understand things. We distinguish always, we have been always distinguishing between good things and bad things, understandable, not understandable. And in that way, mm. we have been also, especially in modern times, in the societies of Global North in particular, between the so-called rational things and the not rational things that we have actually uh, we have a word that we have been synonymously used for non-rational, which is emotional. And so so at the outset of that idea is the fundamental reflection, I would say, to problematize, if you will, these two terms. What does it mean, rational? What does it mean, emotional? Are mm -hmm. these things actually really opposition, in opposition to each other? Isn't it more that they are interrelated, depending on each other, and now to cut the long story short, we know from neurobiology and psychology research that emotions and facts are indeed related, that there is no fact without emotion and vice versa. Hmm. Yet in society, in politics and in contentious politics, especially, we use this opposition. So at the beginning of the special issue stands also this idea, why do we do this? What does it mean actually that we expose truth as something which is in opposition to emotion? What does what kind of actors do we create? What kind of debates does it launch? And I think that at the very beginning of this idea of special issue was a kind of a conversation between me and um, Daniel Carell, my colleague from the Yale University, where we tried to merge our interests, which are at the same time also different. So Daniel works on contentious politics and want to understand the dynamics behind contentious politics. I work in the field of sociology of emotions, so I'm interested in the specifically sociological perspective on emotions. That means that I'm interested in context and circumstances through which some emotions do rise or are sustained or are appeased. So I'm not saying that emotions are not in our minds and in our bodies, but I'm interested in what are the collective imaginaries or the past history that nurture some feelings? What are the gender stereotypes or cultural stereotypes that make us see, for example, the anger of women in a different way than the anger of men? Mm. 
So mm -hmm. the sociological perspective, I would argue, opens a vast field of asking, where do feelings come from? What are the societal backgrounds of these feelings? Uh, how do they then in that way enter politics and make it contentious? And this has been the point of convergence of our mutual conversation between Daniel and myself that gave the rise to take this opposition of emotions and truth that we've been living through since 2016, I'd say, where before 2016, truth was not that much uh, of an interest for a political scientist or political sociologist or sociologist. It was more a philosophical issue. And then with 2016, we actually, truth was itself an issue for politics all over the place. And it became very quickly an opposition to emotions. And I, in my previous work, was trying to understand why is it so and what does it create? And this fact-oriented elite fighting for truth as opposed to ignorant public leaning on emotions only was interesting for me as an opposition that I would see in um, anti-science claims and anti-science protest, but that I would use also more as a lens to understand what is behind that opposition. So what does it mean that people are, that the public is ignorant and leaning on emotions only? What does it mean, especially if we know from psychological and neurobiological research that it's not what it is? So what does this opposition create for us and why do we need it? And that's how we were trying actually to call for articles, if you will, on the special issue that would help us to understand what kind of emotions is up, are up there in different issues on contentious politics? How are these emotions dealt with? And does the perspective through emotions on these issues help us to see something which we would not see before or without the lens. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Going back to the the fact oriented elite versus the the uh, the emotional ignorant public, is there kind of like a class thing going on there? I wanted to say a class war thing going on there. I'm not sure if that's quite the right word or not, but is there something going on there with class? Uh, the short answer would be yes, definitely, because I think that. Um, Okay, let's put it maybe that way. The emotion and truth opposition is at the same time attacking, if you will, the very core of democratic politics. Mm -hmm. Because democracy is about accepting an elite's decision. It's about um, government doing something that we understand, that we trust, and that we accept. So you can't really, in a democracy, argue for something without winning the public. And this winning the public, of course, uh, holds a very strong emotional component. So it's a bit tricky to say that the public is ignorant while well, you need the public to win the elections or to be <laughs> with them on board when you when you want to do something also in a local politics. In our special issue, we have one text on the nuclear waste management mm -hmm. by uh, Hannes Legolov and Jane Pedersen, who show very well that winning the local public over the side of nuclear waste management is crucial to push that project forward. So you need the public and you know that you win the public through emotions. So how do you do that? So I, for example, in my previous work where I was working with what I call the post-factual politics, I was trying to argue that we need to ask more what is behind the so-called ignorance, what is labeled as ignorance in the public discourse? What is behind that? Is it really ignorance in a sense that I don't know? Or is it more that I don't want to know? Or is it that actually these facts that are in front of me are raising uh, all sorts of emotional issues in me? There, I, I feel scared when I see these things. I, I don't want to live in a world like that. I'm anxious. I'm frustrated. I don't have the resources to live in that world, which comes back to your class question. And I think that many current research uh, works on polarization that work with truth and that work with facts versus ignorance do show that it's not ignorance only, if you will, but it's more a combination of lack of resources, lack mm -hmm. of emotional appeasement, I would say, that drives these people, for example, in political circles, where they feel hurt, where they feel understood, where they feel uh, that someone cares for their emotions. And if you look at that 
binary between fact-oriented elite and ignorant public in that way, you can then understand why populism is so much on the rise, despite the fact that what populism uh, cares for or what they suggest does not necessarily help these people out of that. But the way it is, uh, if you will, the way that it is wrapped and the way it is represented for people is something where these people have feeling, well, they can trust this person. They mm -hmm. can see themselves in this person. So maybe this is a more of a like a bridge that at the first sight looks like a bridge too far. But I think that one of the problems that we have currently when we consider the binary between fact-oriented elite and ignorant public is that we have actually let the populist movements steal the emotional appeal from democracy. That we have actually mm. put all the emotional appeals and all the trust through emotions and arguing through emotions on the populist side of the political spectrum. And if we well, would yeah. think about some societal outcomes of the research that we present in our special issue, then it would be the question, how can we gain emotions back on the side of democratic politics? Well, thank you, Anna. It's, uh, um, one, of, one of your article authors, Vanessa K. Bittner, they, they talk about icons, specifically Greta Thunberg, Meghan Markle, Colin Kaepernick. Uh, when, when Kaepernick took the knee, he was hailed by some medias as speaking out against structural racism, uh, while other medias called him ungrateful and disrespectful to veterans. Uh, Bittner says that this polarization extended to the general public and how they saw one another. How were people interacting in that way through Kaepernick? Well, the interesting thing about Vanessa Bittner's article is that she shows that the icon approach helps us to see first why people can interpret the same deed in a diametrically opposed way, and also that these icon amplify feelings that are already there, amplify interpretation, and that it's not necessarily uh, that we would know or we would care why, Ka uh, why Kaepernick did what he did. It's no longer the issue. The issue is how the supporters and the opponents think of his intentions. So it's no longer the discussion about whether these intention for trial in the public debate is correct, but it's more, it is there and it lives its own life, if you will, and it amplifies the societal moods that are actually personified through icons like that. And while Vanessa doesn't speak about that in her article herself, I assume that she would also make this parallel through the research that she did, that we have now currently a very, very relevant picture of something like that through the pop singer Taylor Swift. We can okay. see how Taylor Swift, whether we like her songs or not, mm. whether we think she's authentic or not, how her public image, her icon, if you will, works in both ways. It's a personification of a pop star presenting liberal democratic values, if you will. Mm -hmm. And these were would be all the stories uh, that would portray not only in the media, but also in social media and in conversation, Taylor Swift as paying uh, her um, people differently, caring about her uh, surroundings differently and doing this and that. While opposed to that, you would have people who would be fighting exactly that as not authentic, as something which is against conservative values. And mm. the whole thing uh, of her dating one of uh, the most important American football players uh, is also inauthentic and not believable. And what is it? And it's a theater and it's, it's harmful. And you see actually that it's no longer about Taylor Swift. It's about what she as an icon represents and that she represents on the one on, on the one hand, the, if you will, democratic hope that a young pop singer, a woman can actually, but at the same time, she also represents this threat of the world that's been changing, that even if you <laughs> dare, then I make it a very stereotypical right now, that you have a fair haired American heter heterosexual white girl being actually a country uh, singer at the beginning, mm -hmm. but fighting openly for democratic values. So you have also something which Vanessa also calls a dialectic icon. So merging in 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 the person to very diametrically opposed interpretation of this world. 
And what is interesting is, as I said at the beginning, it's no longer about her and her personal intention. It's not even about her authenticity. It's about how this authenticity is played at this field, which is actually not a field of Taylor Swift music anymore. It's a field of conservative versus democratic values, values over women's rights versus conservative uh, stereotypes about women and so on. So this approach shows us also to look at these persons very differently, to maybe, if you will, skip the discussion over whether this is her or not her, but looking at how is she interpreted, because these interpretations can tell us more about the contentious politics over uh, who's going to be the next president in the United States in this case. Yeah, the, uh, wow, yeah, it's not it's not anything to do with Taylor Swift. That's quite a, my, my eyes opening to it, just the, the fact that like we're, we're able to see we're kind of able to like take the temperature of the of that society right now judging by how taylor swift who has no who has who has no kind of power in how she's how she's perceived we we get to we get to see kind of how what everyone's thinking and feeling through the way that they're perceiving her but at the same time maybe uh, we can also argue that it's not completely out of herself she's maybe playing that at this specific mm. time and if i remember remember that correct it's been some time ago where she actually made a statement for young people to vote it's also that in some of her songs you do see if you will democratic issues as for example in the song only the young where she problematizes the gun violence among um among uh, american people so it's not uh as I would say, it's not completely out uh, of the blue that these interpretations right. come. And that's actually where this interpretive approach that we have uh, in Vanessa Spittner's contribution is powerful to show us what are what is the societal background? What are the collective moods upon that the icon would rise and will be interpreted and will then necessarily live its own life? But it's not completely out of the blue. It's at the same mm -hmm. time very much also reflected by the past histories, by the past narratives, by collective imaginaries of what is a pop singer, what is a female pop singer, what is mm -hmm. a white heterosexual woman being on the public scene, and so on. And then those two opposed camps, they're kind of picking and choosing what what parts of Taylor Swift's image they want to make meaning out of. They're also choosing what parts of what they see as the stereotype of a country singer turned into a pop megastar. They, they, they're, they're picking and choosing what, what helps their argument. Is that what's going on there? Yes. And in sociological approach to emotions, we very often emphasize that as human beings, we like to hear stories and we like to interpret those stories. So we can also see the composition of the world surrounding us as a whole set of stories offered to us and we do the interpretations. We don't do these interpretations just like that. We uh, have our own personal biographies, our social biography, our collective moods of the nation where we come from or our um, ethnic background, and all that comes together. What I think is so powerful for us as sociologists or political sociologists especially is that we can see all these um, fights over a pop singer as a fight of values, as a fight mm. of narratives and representations. And we can gain a much bigger understanding of what's happening there. I could make a really uh, change of scene completely to show you that we can take the same approach also to very diametrically different topic, which is also in our special issue, which which is the topic of the, of the uh, nuclear waste management mm. sites. Mm -hmm. Even there, it's not completely just like that, that the interpretation and then the lack of trust or the emotions that come with them would appear. There is an emotional history of nuclear um, waste management, or there are sites that linked even indirectly to nuclear waste because they are sites of uh, nuclear energy, sites like Fukushima or Chernobyl, that even though they are not related to that specific, uh, specific site of nuclear waste management, they work in the interpretation. Mm -hmm. And they work in the interpretation, I would uh, emphasize, in the context of this special issue, through emotions, through emotions as a specific interpretation of the facts. 
This is this is linking to uh, Hans Lagerlöf and Jane Peterson's article, isn't it, um, uh, about nuclear waste management, uh, where they where they um, where they 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 they're arguing about policy and that uh, policy shouldn't just be decided only by science, but um, or science and rationality. They say that there should also be emotion, subjectivity, uh, feeling taken into taken into account when creating policy. Um, can you can you kind of uh, explain a bit more about like why? why something is yeah I, I think of nuclear waste management and i i think of you know all the danger is what i what i think of this that's my immediate thought and so like why 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 do emotion subjectivity feeling why 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 should they come into the the making of policy when it comes to nuclear waste management okay i think that to answer this question i'd like to take a slight step back to this mm. why do we actually why are we scared about uh subjectivity and feeling being brought in um the issue of politics uh, mm -hmm. altogether. And I'd like to go back to one of our initial discussions with Daniel Carell and myself over this issue, emotion and truth. And we can start with a very everyday casual observation that many of us maybe are having or have been, uh, have had uh, during these past years, where we would agree that very often we just don't want to deal with those emotions. We just don't want to deal with all these anti-science nonsense that's been out there in social media or sometimes even uh, within political statements. We just want to science do its job, the facts speak for themselves, and above all, we don't want to hear these subjective stories. We want to get this done, which is something very much related to how we function as a society, where uh, feelings can be disturbing, yet they are needed. Mm. We can't do this without feelings completely. And that's what um, Hannes Lagerlöf and Jane Patterson show very well, because we live in a democratic society where we need the public trust. If we don't have the public trust, uh, we have even more the danger that people will oppose to these decisions, that they will go, as we say, down the rabbit hole and even radicalize themselves. That's not what we want to do. So it's in our strategic interest to gain these people, to gain their trust. And that's where the emotional component comes in. So we need to, if it's about convincing those people, it's not going to work with science and scientific facts only. We need to listen to their emotional history. We don't need to endorse it 100%, but we need to listen to it. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's actually maybe counterintuitive at the beginning that we need to speak about subjectivity and feeling because it creates more safety in the long term. We maybe are not reluctant to accept an image about a feelingful person managing um, a nuclear waste, but that's not what this idea is about. This idea is more about how can we design a political process around the nuclear waste management that is sustainable, emotionally sustainable, mm -hmm. meaning that it takes care of the contentious issues that are out there. It doesn't evacuate them. It doesn't put them aside, away from the negotiation table, if you will, but it takes them on board, talks about them, reflects them, gives them place in order to get, in order to allow science to do its job. That's uh, yeah, that's um, I found that that article quite powerful as well in terms of just like people don't just want to know that the fact is they are safe; they want to feel that they are safe. That's that 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 was quite a powerful kind of understanding I was taking from that article that I've never really considered before. That just like if uh, if the if the nuclear scientists tell me that it's safe, then then yeah, of course it's not enough. Like we need we need that feeling of safety too, in order to actually uh, kind of you know go along with it. And I think that for that feeling of safety, we also need to have uh, the feeling that we and our feelings have been taken seriously, that there's someone right. who cares for us, which is something very fundamental in politics, yet very difficult in times of globalized politics and in times of such a uh, densely networked society, if you will, you, you don't have a phone number of your prime minister anymore. And it's, it's no, it's not about that, but you still need to create some kind of complicity that you're listening, that you care about the people. Mm -hmm. And that's where we come back to this uh, idea that I had that one of the societal outcomes of all this research on sociology of emotions and truth could be to think actively about uh, ways to 
gain emotions back on the side of democratic politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Anna. An an another another writer, Anna Berg. They they interviewed multiple people with what she called information enthusiasm. I I not heard this term before but I love I love the term those those who are always online watching videos about news stories and trying to gather details from every angle uh, sounded a lot like um, amateur private investigators uh, their the, their sources though very varied um, were not always true uh, was what I was reading in the article but 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 Berg mentions that truth is not necessarily what's most important for these participants that she that she um, interviewed. Um, instead, they're evaluating content based on creativity and originality. And uh, I was wondering whether kind of has this basis for news evaluation, um, has it seeped into the mainstream as well? And therefore, is it posing a threat? So this is a very exciting question because it also shows one of the main challenges that we have when we say we want to... Uh, when emotions back on the side of democracy, we need to listen to people, we need to care about their opinions and especially about their emotions. It looks like a very nice fairy tale about like we have the recipe is only about wanting. Mm -hmm. And yet you can now say, well, but we see, for example, that where we have sort of listened to emotional appeals of people and by the public is the news media content where we very much started to do sensational news, to create click bites, to create uh, emotionally intensive shortcuts, uh, picking up uh, those emotional parts of the story and putting them up there into the title in order to get attention. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a media expert, but I'm quite sure that one of some media expert would tell you that this is exactly the problem that we have right now with the news content that's all about being original being sensational attaching emotionally to the reader at that content wise it's going back or even what's more concerning me is that we do not have that much counterintuitive content anymore rather than inciting the reader to feel unsettled we feed him feed them the content to settle their emotions and their biases and their stereotypes. So how do we actually come out of that? Because if we want to win people back, mm. we need to hear what Anna Berg's saying with her analysis, that it's about more information enthusiasm, that it's not about truth, that these people like to listen to these videos and hear these news, and that maybe if we want to win them on our side, we should think of that. And yet we know that we have done some of that already in the mainstream media, and it doesn't really work well. So I must disappoint you because I don't have the answer, but I think that the way we can search for the answer lies with one of the fundamental questions in sociology, which is how much of individual is inside an individual cho choice we're making. We live in a society that is highly individualized. We are praising individualism, especially in global north and in liberal democracies. It's all about our self-determined individual choices. But are they really individual for everyone? Mm -hmm. How much impact is there from your social background, culture background, education, public infrastructure that is offered to it? Isn't it maybe too much asked that we have actually given away the news content on the side of the individual. There is a difference between a person like me trained in academic reading and trained actually in information gathering and information organizing and information evaluation and someone who has not that training or even not those resources, who has a very different job, sometimes for even 10 hours a day. And after that, they just want to have fun. So isn't that maybe also not about news content only, and media information only, but about the very organization of our lives. Like what are the expectations upon us as individuals? And uh, maybe changing those public infrastructure, accepting that it's not the same individual choice for every individual in the society could be a start to have a very different type of conversation. So rather than asking, why do people like those news is, or, or no, rather than asking, how can we make democratic news more original and sensational and emotionally attached? It's maybe more about like, how can we change the conversation toward more what's important? What are the values in the society? And is news gathering really the way we should get people on board? Isn't there a 
isn't there a different way how we can actually steer news content without falling on the propaganda misinformation or whatever side? Mm. But I don't have the answer, but I think it's something we should be talking about more and beyond the specific topic of communication and political communication in particular. Yeah, with um with the the kind of yeah, with the emotion in in news media and the sensationalism and and things like if we need to be paying more attention to emotions, then could news media, I know you said you don't have all the answers, but I'm interested in in what you what you do have because you've got you've done so much work in in emotions and politics and that could there not be some sort of way into improving news using using emotion as a tool so not as a way to kind of sensationalize and get people scared or happy or satiated in whatever way they need to be but just kind of like these these things matter to people and we can we can harness emotions for the greater good in order to get people to read or listen or watch these news stories is there something in that i think that to answer your question i have one particular anecdote on my mind that uh, happened during the COVID times mm. And although it, the discussion have been slightly different in many countries, depending on uh, the specific political tra trajectories it had, I'd argue that there was one mediating impact that we have seen, which was that we did talk about emotions more openly, about anxiety of people, about their frustration, about the necessity to overcome that. And I remember that I got in rage, which is related to what I've been doing, because in my work on emotion and politics, I think the main um, argument that I was trying to operationalize and visualize with my research was that emotions do different things with different people and different situations, and that the same emotion not only is not interpreted in the same way um, across genders, ethnic uh, origins, or social backgrounds, but also we do not have the same resources to mobilize these emotions, soothe them, uh, sustain them, explain them. And so I got enraged because I would have wished that we would have, if you will, that kind of sociological reading of emotions in our news content, that it would not be about people are scared, but we would unpack those people. And especially we would unpack those feelings. We would really actively talk about what does it mean that these people are frightened? Where does it come from? And do they have actually, does their biography explain why they are so fearful? What is their daily life? And I missed a lot of that. I had the feeling that very often the, the way pandemic was discussed in the media was uh, pervaded by the group uh, that have been most listened to, the mm -hmm. most privileged ones, and that we didn't actually hear, we didn't have the access to the counterintuitive stories, to the stories of marginal people uh, that had a very different reading of the emotional living through the pandemic, and thus maybe very different political responses to what's being decided, what, ha what had been decided by the governments. So I would wish more public sociology of emotions in the news content to get people, to let people have a more subtle reading of emotions and their social background and culture background. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Anna. You saying earlier in uh, today that, um, that populism has benefited from kind of the harnessing of emotions and that we need, if I remember this right, that we need to bring back the harnessing of emotions to democracy, to, 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 to rebuild democracy with that. How do we go about doing that? That's a very difficult question. I think if I knew, I probably uh, weren't a professor at the university, but may be hired by some of the political parties right now that try to win populist votes. But to give you a proper academic answer, I think that, for example, starting with problematizing this division between fact-oriented elite and ignorant public, starting to first ask, what does it even ignorant public mean? Starting to highlight that there is not only a fact-oriented elite, but we have people like Donald Trump, for example, or very different, very important political figures having the resources to read the facts and to have them in front of them, yet not really representing them, mm -hmm. misinforming, strategically ignoring, as Lindsay McGowey, a UK sociologist, 
at the University of Essex would say that there is also a lot of strategic ignorance by those who govern, not really reading the facts. So that the picture, if you will, is very complex. That would be, I think, the first step to allow these people not feel unheard and not feel labeled as ignorance that are actually um, not really um, not really invited to the discussion table. A second thing would be to have a discourse, have a public discourse on these emotions and maybe have the subtle, I think it would be necessary also to say that while I explain where these emotions come from, why explain why these people might uh, see them as authentic and understandable, I do not necessarily endorse them. I think we have too little discussion on this, mm. that we need a lot more critical discussion on where do feelings come from without saying that I'm endorsing these people, but I need to understand where radicalization comes from. I need to understand where hate comes from. I need to understand why people hate someone in order maybe to explain them, maybe to find the point of convergence as we had with the discussion over the advocacy coalition framework to win them on my side. I need to more emphasize what uh, what we have in common. And I think we would all agree, despite the fact that we are from different nations and different backgrounds, that we see that this polarization has become a sort of a discourse. We like to talk about polarization. We like to talk about diametrically opposed societies that do not talk to each other. And yet I could tell you as a sociologist, that's nothing new. We have been as a society always stratified and we could more argued that there has been a lot more communication across classes than there has been 100 years ago. So maybe uh, this polarization discourse is not something we should jump onto, but that we should reflect, like, where does it come from? Why do we talk about polarization in the first place? Uh, what is it we talk about? Maybe it's uh, the same emotions, but differently interpreted because we have different biographical histories. I'm not sure I'm really giving you the answer you would like to have, but I think that these might not, be, I think that all I want to say is that it might not be about big steps, like big recipes, how to win over populist fights, but this might be also about little steps that changes, uh, little steps that change the reading of the world surrounding us, that changes the reading of contentious politics we have in front of us. Mm. That changes the reading of the class issues we have. Just, let's say, maybe trying a different type of conversation because it seems that the democratic conversation we've been having for two decades doesn't really work well. Yeah. Does that um does that ex extend to other places too, like education, politics, business? I suppose it, it, it should it should we be should we be making this change everywhere? Well, I must say that from my perspective, I've been working with emotions and politics, and then specifically in health politics, women's politics, and I've been also working in urban politics. And to cut the long story short, I think that whenever I chose a different empirical terrain, I was very interested uh, by seeing that some of the uh, mediating interest in more and more opening up uh, emotionally and more and more discussing about how emotions work uh, are not necessarily linked to health only or education only or women's politics only, but are actually something like a new discourse. We certainly do live in a world that speaks more openly about emotions, that cares about emotions. We argue through emotions on in the workplace, there are a lot of emotions, uh, which is not some something new, but the way we bring emotions forward and uh, label them as something important does uh, certainly go um, beyond the specific uh, area of politics and is important in business and the representation and, and management, how we actually work with emotions, with different emotional types. It is something we see also in culture, we could also take a look on the film production where it is more and more about um, emotional histories of people. It's not about the social history, but we uh, we have a lot of series, for example, where it's about the feelings of the person. So it's it's a way through which we now try to understand our world. But this does not mean... Um, Emotion do not automatically mean that we would love each other more, that we would understand each other more. Emotions go in both directions. That's why I think we need to understand what emotions do in particular moments, that they do different things in different moments, that they do different things with different people, and that they can be a challenge, they can be a tool, but they can be also a danger.
Well, thanks so much for coming on the Transform Society podcast today, Anna. It's been such a pleasure to chat to you to discuss your your special issue. Uh, and thanks for being so so generous with uh, you know, we're talking about it today. I'm going to let everybody know where they can find your special issue in a moment. But first, I wanted to ask, um, is there anywhere, uh, are you online where we can find you? I sort of use former Twitter, now X, but mm-hmm. I'm using it less and less for all these emotional reasons that right. or yes. emotional atmosphere that I raise at this platform. I also do have a Blue Sky account and Instagram account. I think that the most that the easiest way to get to my work is actually through the Google Scholar profile. Okay. I'm working on my new website where I could gather all those things, but I think if you want to get uh, if you want to know uh, more about my academic work, the Google Scholar profile is the best. And then on X Twitter, I do have some um some bits of my of my work also of uh, shorter texts and inputs and I'd be happy to engage more uh, through that platform with anyone who's interested in that. Great. Thanks, Anna. Emotions and the Truths of Contentious Politics, Advances in Research on Emotions, Knowledge and Contemporary Contentious Politics, guest edited by Anna Dornova and Daniel Carell, is published by Bristol University Press. You can find out more about the special issue by going to bristoluniversitypressdigital.com and also transformingsociety.co.uk.